Today, I'm going to try to beat a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Omega Ruby with only randomly generated Pokemon. Now, Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire are the Pokemon games that I haven't played in the longest time out of the entire main series, so I thought, why not make this complete madness by randomizing all encounters? But also, the Pokemon that every single trainer in the game has, with even the potential of them having legendaries too. I have no idea how this is gonna go, but I know it's gonna get wild no matter what. Let's see if we can beat Pokemon Omega Ruby with only the first random Pokemon we find on each route, no items in battle, level caps in place, and the battle mode on set at all times. Now you guys know I've taken a bit of a break since uploading last, and that's because I've been a bit occupied playing mobile games. Okay, that's not the real reason. I've had some IRL stuff going on, but I have been playing a fair bit, especially today's sponsor, Rush Royale, which has been a blast as a wicked tower defense game that involves powering up your heroes to stop the onslaught of enemies from reaching your gate, and which you can download using my link below or QR code on screen. With unreal hero upgrades available, unique abilities, new unlockable heroes, and techniques like allocating your mana you get from defeating each enemy to summon more heroes, level them up, or even combining heroes for a combo boost, this game is the epitome of pick up and play fun with real-time strategy in both PvP and co-op, sending the enemies that you defeat to overload your opponent. Defend the damn tower! Wait a minute, did you hear that? Was that? No, it couldn't have been. Unless... That's right, available for a limited time until July 29th, but keepable forever. Social media star turned boxer Jake Paul is picking a new fight as the first collaborative hero in the game, and he wants you to defend the damn tower. With unique abilities like Super Punch, which can be used twice, Hype and Energy Boost to boost your unit stats and increase the critical hit chance, and even Memory Photo to reduce monsters' armor and cause additional damage, he's quite an addition to any team. In true media star fashion, the more likes that he gets, he can perform a special jump to deal fall damage and shoot monsters on camera. Install Rush Royale for free using my link in the description or scan the QR code on screen to experience the thrill. And you'll also get a special master chest bonus with helpful rewards which can be exchanged for a legendary card. The event is limited though so don't miss out. Alright here we go and before we get into it I've gotta say this is probably one of the coolest looking screens in the franchise hands down. They nailed it. Uh, huh. Not gonna lie, this kind of looks exactly like the original game. Whoa. Okay, this is far too meta for me. Now, everyone always goes nuts about how attractive the moms are in the franchise, but that has me wondering, why not May's mom? Look at this dude. Oh, no, no, no. Ooh, looks like May's got a special silver edition Wii U. Maybe that design would have saved the console. After Professor Birch gets chased down by a Puchina, which I could have sworn was a Zigzagoon in the originals, we get to pick our starter, and that's right, they're fully randomized. Okay, pretty cool choices, but I think this is an obvious pick, as I go for Dino. Pitting her in battle, I notice she has Dragon Rage, which does a set 40 HP damage every time, incredible for the early game, as not many Pokemon have that much to begin with. Checking her out in our party, yup, randomized abilities too, and we got Defeatist. One of the few actually bad abilities lowering our stats if we get below half health. Are you kidding me? We do have a plus special attack nature at least. On Route 103 we've got our first rival battle with Mei and whatever starter she gets is going to be the one that sticks with her and it ends up being a Magby. I feel like we can account for that as we quickly end her hopes and dreams of being a trainer. With Pokeballs now in hand it's time to set off on our adventure and find our first wild encounter. Oh god, why? A combi and a male, which means it cannot evolve. Our very first encounter can't evolve. I can't even. Oh. Well, might as well catch it, as it has a quirky neutral nature and the runaway ability. Huh. I guess if we ever get stuck in a scary battle, we can throw this damn thing out there. Back on Route 103, we can now grab another encounter, this time a Cleffa, which I catch and nickname Molly, and who has an adamant plus attack and minus special attack nature with pickpocket. Oh, and it's somehow holding an escape rope too? Let me escape from this game. Or better yet, I could use it to- okay, never mind. Route 102 surely has a better pick for us, right? Oh, come on! Hello, Matt. Neutral nature. Chlorophyll. Okay. Surely our first trainer battle in the game can't make things any worse for us, right? Hello there. 
Honestly, Dragon Rage is the only thing that could have saved us here as that thing was charging up an 80 power high critical hit ratio move. If it hadn't gone for a two turn move on us, yikes. Alright, Route 104 and you have got to be kidding me. I name her Belle, and she's got a plus special defense and minus speed nature with Lightning Rod. We've now had more misses than an Amy Schumer special. After scraping by a battle with a fully evolved Nido Queen, we reach the Petalburg Woods where we find a Hoot Hoot that has the Drought ability. Okay, that's kinda cool. It was also holding a Moonstone perfect for our Cleffa. Whoa, a random choice specs item on the ground too. Alright, things are picking up. Are you sure about that? Oh, welcome to the team, Rebecca. Making our way through the forest, we have our first evolution as Belle becomes a Cricketoon. Okay, I tried. Sorry you girls had to witness that. The first major city is upon us, Rustboro, and I forgot the remakes had this really cool, beautiful town overview. A great touch. Hmm, what's this? Time-saving tunnel nearing completion. That's what it says on the sign, but there's also a big X splashed across it. Oh boy, as someone who's worked in construction, this is all too accurate. Route 116 nets us a new encounter, this time a Skitty who I named Mel. And hitting up the Ruster Tunnel ahead, we can also grab a Shinx who I named Beth. And we find a Kangaskhanite of all things. Oh, this is gonna be fun, isn't it? Checking our newer encounters in the PC, I find out that Caterpie has the Protein ability to give every move that it uses same type attack bonus or stab. And Shinx is adamant with the Cheek Pouch ability, so I'm gonna add them along. I also noticed that Bell got the Thick Fat ability, which is basically going to get rid of her fire weakness. Apparently, Pokemon get new abilities every time that they evolve, too, which is going to be chaos. Not too long after, and Rebecca fully evolves into a heavy metal Butterfree. No, I mean, that's the ability that she got. Although, who knows, maybe she enjoys some Slayer. The first gym is upon us, the Rustboro one, and boy, oh boy, I forgot how much they overhauled them with cool designs. In here, we fought against a very threatening Vigoroth trainer, but Dragon Rage is saving our butts right now. I'm not going to lie. The first gym leader is Roxanne, normally a rock type trainer, but since we don't know what she's gonna have, there's no way to prepare. Let's just go for it. She ends up leading with a Gumi as I get Natalie out there. I attach the choice specs on her for same type attack bonus uproar, and it does over half on its first hit. Meaning after she protects, I can hit her again for the KO, only getting hit by a tackle in the process. Her ace then comes in, and it's the legendary Ace Elf. Holy sh! Thankfully, she just went for Imprison on the first turn, and Uproar does only about a third. Confusion then rocks us to 11 HP, and we hit her once more to a quarter before we finally get Natalie to calm down and are now able to switch. With Dana being part Dark type, she is the perfect switch in as Roxanne Potions. Then we can hit her with a couple stab super effective bites after she used Rest to take her down. Oh. Thankfully, her only offensive move Dana was immune to, otherwise that would have been nasty for us. For winning, we get a great reward as Beth evolves into a Luxio, quite the stat upgrade. The fun wasn't over yet though, as I had accidentally set up Drought by leading with Hoot Hoot against a damn Magma Grunt's Torquoise of all things, which nearly crushed us, but Dana's typing and Dragon Rage came in clutch. One thing that didn't occur to me is because we're facing higher evolutions than we normally would, our XP bars are moving quick, so we've got to watch the level caps. Also, how in the world? Hello, welcome to the Devon Corporation. How may I help you? <laughs> Harassing Mr. Briny enough has him bring us to Duford Town on his millionaire mega yacht. And after a team shakeup to help us not overlevel some team members, here we can pick up the silk scarf to boost normal moves. And also the old rod, which is actually the key to get a new encounter here, as there's only water. And here we find. Damn it, what is wrong with this game? A Weedle. Hello, Olivia. The Granite Cave is also located here, and I found a Trap Inch, fantastic, which ends up having Snow Warning. I'm not sure how beneficial that is for a future Dragon and Ground type, but I name him Evan and keep heading through. Eventually, Olivia fully evolves into a Beedrill, who ends up getting Rough Skin, which is actually pretty good. The Doofer Gym is upon us, and here I ended up learning a lesson the hard way. I was facing a trainer with Vigoroth as I had Mel out, and I decided to hit him with Silk Scarf Stab Tackle, learning not only how weak Mel is, but also we got crit by Uproar. Uh oh. So I switch into Rebecca, and we got crit again. I did have a berry though, which brought us above half again, and then we got crit again, but I went for sleep powder, and it apparently doesn't work, even on the last turn of uproar. What in the world? Our team is incredibly weak at the moment, especially with our missing team members, but I got Evan out there, and got crit again to just 6 HP. Then, hail brought us down to 4. What is happening? I get Matt out there now, as I have like no choice 
choices left and another crit down to just 2 HP before the hail then takes down Matt for our first death. Well, at least we get a free switch now as I send out Olivia and no crit for the very first time this battle. We also poisoned him with Poison Sting so I'm hoping and praying that we can make this happen and she switches to Scratch instead and I was like yes, a contact move? Which means she now gets rough skin recoil, poison damage and hail and gets taken down. Wow. Evan with a base 100 attack as a completely unevolved Pokemon definitely did help through the other gym trainers though. However, we eventually ran into a trainer with Primal Groudon of all things, and I knew it had Ancient Power, which is a disaster for our entire team, so I couldn't switch into something like Butterfree, and I was hoping Bulldoze would lower its speed enough to be able to take it down on the next turn, but nope. It outspeeds even still and decimates Evan with the final mud shot. With that painful loss behind us, it's time for the second gym leader, Brawly, normally a fighting type trainer. He leads with a Piplop, and fortunately enough, I went with Beth, our Luxio. As one might expect, this was a one-sided affair as I used Charge to raise our special defense and increase the power of Spark, which decimates him. His second and final Pokemon is a Masquerade, not only not having Intimidate now, but also being weak to Electric, and we got a crit on our next attack to one-hit KO him. Pretty unreal. I feel we deserved a bit of a break after Primal Groudon. Two badges down. Deep in Granite Cave, we meet the mysterious Stephen Stone who's trying to uncover mysteries about the Hoenn region. Oh, wait, yeah, I just saw one of those big giant legendary beast things. You what? Now, one thing that didn't occur to me upon reaching Slateport is that the non-Mart shops actually have random items too, including even cheap Eviolites apparently. What a score. I thought the Alakazite was also pretty cool, but uh, apparently it's normally here anyway. Okay, that looks like one disturbed individual. Oh right, I forgot Wallace's niece is in this game. Lysia, scout me to be your next boyfriend. Oh, my man is down bad. Okay, this Route 110 view is just too cool. Speaking of cool, our next encounter ends up being a Rog and Rolla, which I catch and nickname Tommy. Oh, and as I quickly found out, apparently trainers don't even actually need to Mega Evolve their Pokemon, they just kind of show up already Mega Evolved. The infamous Route 110 rival battle is upon us, but I'm hoping with such a beastly team, d we can pull this off. She leads with a Sand Isle this time around as I get Dana out there. We did get trapped by Sand Tomb before Dragon Rage barely didn't take her out in the red, and we got brought to just 15 HP before our berry, after which another attack took her down. In comes her now evolved Magmar next, and our best option here is to switch Beth back in as we get our accuracy lowered. Fire Spin then locks us in as I go for charge, and then we get hit with a crit out of nowhere to just 6 HP, but our berry helps and a super powered spark brings her to the red and gets paralysis. Unfortunately, we are are trapped by fire spin but with the paralysis we're now able to outspeed and can take her down. That status was clutch. In comes her final Pokemon, thankfully just a Happini so I can switch Mel in for a normal versus normal showdown with Mel eventually getting the job done. Alright, some close calls but no deaths that time around. Ooh, look at that, there's even a camera angle hint at New Mauville. Go remakes go. Oh. Oh yeah, I forgot Mauville is just a huge indoor mall now. I gotta be honest, for nostalgic reasons, this is the city that I was most excited to see remade, and then they turned it into this. <laughs> there are some great TMs in the Mart at least. While training up for the next gym, our beloved Natalie evolves into a Noctowl, which ends up having the unburdened ability to raise speed if she consumes a berry. Perfect for citrus ones. The Mauville gym is up next, and the trainers in here had some threatening Pokemon like Quagsire, but I didn't know just how bad it was going to be, as in comes a legendary Terrakion of all things. Now, take a second to look at our team. Yup, 5 out of 6 are weak to its typing. And I'm so sorry I didn't anticipate a Terrakion of all things when team building with random Pokemon. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, this thing decimated Dana with a double kick as I knew it would outspeed anything else that we send in with a rock move, and then I send in Rebecca for the super effective confusion, but instantly one KO'd with Smackdown. This is not good. I then threw Natalie out there, hoping to put it to sleep with Hypnosis, and we did get brought to half before our berry, and we land the sleep too. With the speed boost and not being able to switch, I go for uproar now, but he wakes up immediately after the very first turn. Why? Yup, two more hits take Natalie down as well. This is devastating. 
Here I send in Bell, and I go for the long shot after one struggle bug, Bide. Miraculously, he decided to go for double kick and then quick attack instead of smackdown, so the legendary Bell unleashes huge damage and demolishes an actual legendary Pokemon. Holy, I was not expecting that, but three losses is still tough to handle. At least we do now get an evolution though, as Molly finally loves us enough to become a Clefairy. With Krikatoon and Luxio now overleveled, I add Combi back to the team and go searching for new encounters on Route 117, where we find a Bidoof that I named Danny and who has a plus attack nature too. Cool. In no time, Danny evolves into a Bee Barrel with the White Smoke ability, which at this point, I'll gladly take. Knowing we need all the help we can get, I also use our Moonstone to evolve Molly into a Clefable, who ends up having Cloud9 to stop weather. Finally, we have a bulky presence on our team. It's time to take on the third gym leader, Watson, normally a nightmare for Hoenn runs. He starts the battle off with a Fortress, as I had led with our newly evolved Danny. Uh... Not a great matchup, as he walls the hell out of us. Regardless, I decide to go for Defense Curl, hoping I can double the power of our rollout and start a sweep. However, after our very first hit, he uses Self-Destruct out of nowhere, and we survive on just 16 HP before our berry. Wow. In comes a Dust Ox, perfect for rollout, but we miss our next one and get slammed low with Venoshock. Goodness gracious. I'm forced to switch, so I go into Tommy who tanks a Venoshock and a Poison Powder before... missing Rock Blast. Are you kidding me? He then goes for Confusion, and we miss our next one too. What the hell? Another Confusion then brings us to a quarter before we finally land an attack, but only get two hits off. This is unbelievable. Here, I switch into Mike, and I'm starting to get a bit nervous as he crits us and then poisons us before our stab super effective Gust barely doesn't KO him in the red. And my greatest fear comes true as he heals almost fully. This is not good. At this point, I have nothing I can safely switch in, so I keep landing Gust, and eventually we're left on just 1 HP before Poison takes Mike down. Well, I mean, a combi that can't evolve that wasn't gonna do much for us anyway, but... Here, I send in Mel, who gets poisoned as well. Tackle only does a quarter damage, and him and I exchange blows repeatedly, but he starts using Moonlight to restore health again, so we get brought to the red by poison quickly. My last hope is Olivia, who I send in to absorb a Venoshock, then go for Bug Gem Boosted Twin Needle, and it does just enough to take that damn thing down. Man, oh man, I could not have foreseen us struggling with a Dust Ox that much. His final Pokemon is a Huntail, and we have one last hope in Molly, who not only has great defenses, but also also has super effective Magical Leaf, so two hits get the job done with us taking minimal damage. Our team got hurt bad by that battle, but we got the badge. Looking at our Pokemon collection, I've gotta be honest, we're not looking too hot with six Pokemon already in the graveyard, but I'm hoping with new routes opening up now, we can get some good encounters. Starting on Route 112, we find a Snow Run who I catch and nickname William. Then, on the Fiery Path, we ironically enough find a Water-type Tentacool who I catch and nickname Meredith. Along our journey, we ran into a trainer with a legendary Deoxys of all things, but thank god it had Imposter, so it turned into a bee barrel like ours. Too good. As if that wasn't enough of a scare, the same trainer then unleashed a Mega Alakazam on us, which crit Molly with confusion, but Beth was able to avoid his attack on the switch and respond with a super effective bite to eliminate that huge threat. Up ahead on Route 113, we then run into a seal that I named Edgar, and I've always wanted to use a dugong, so I'm pretty happy about this. You, you may think I'm joking, but no, I, I, I love Dugong. I was then trying to avoid trainers, and please tell me how this makes any sense at all. She was literally facing the other way and saw us somehow. Uh, yeah, of course you would have that. Molly was able to save the day on below half health. Reaching Fall Arbor Town, apparently Professor Cosmo is missing, and, like, if your husband gets abducted, do you think one would just be smiling like that? Kinda weird. Hitting up the move relearner, apparently Danny can relearn a move called Rototiller? I don't think I've ever heard of that before, but okay. Route 116 nets us a really cool new encounter, a fully evolved Crawdon, which I named Pete. We'll have to check all our new encounters out on the PC later. Uh, never in my life did I think I'd see a Beedrill succeed in battle against a Hoopa Unbound, but that quad effectiveness might have saved our whole team if I'm honest. After watching May tripping out talking to people that aren't there, we- Ooh, interstellar berries! <laughs> Meteor Falls nets us a new encounter in the form of a swineup that I named Pablo, and we also have a great upgrade as Tommy evolves into a Bulldor, who not only will be great with Eviolite, but also has battle armor so he can't get crit. Wicked. 
Checking out our new catches, it turns out that Tentacool has Sheer Force, which would boost the power of both Bubble Beam and Acid Spray, and can use an Eviolite, so that should be a monster play. Crawdon ended up having Water Absorb, which is kinda meh. As expected, Meredith the Tentacool indeed performs amazingly well with Sheer Force, taking on some threats that you'd otherwise assume would be tough matchups. At the top of Mount Chimney stands Magma Leader Maxi, who evidently thinks standing on a glass floor above a volcano pit is a great idea. Let's join! Him. And here comes the Deoxys defense form as I led with a poison type. Oh boy. Fortunately, I had looked it up and apparently Deoxys shouldn't have any psychic moves yet, so I could repeatedly slam it with Sheer Force Bubble Beam, being hurt little throughout, and his Trap Inch was of course a one-shot with the same move. His final Pokemon is a Raikou, which does have electric moves. Switching in Bath was scary with spikes having been set up, and Bite does little against him, but he kept roaring us and racking up hazard damage, although Rock Slide did a great amount. At one point, he roared in our HM Mon, so I just let it die before getting Tommy back out there to take him down with a Rock Slide at half health remaining. Definitely scary, but manageable. <laughs> of course, the Rain Dance TM would be beside the giant pool of lava. Checks out. On the climb, back down, we could pick up our next encounter, which I was very hyped about, a timber that I named Eleanor. And with that, we arrived at the next gym location, Loveridge Town. Resisting the temptation to bathe in the hot springs with elderly people, I instead go on a private date with one. I wish I could lay an egg. You like popsicles? This was a big mistake. The Loveridge Gym is our next stop, and as a fire gym, isn't it kind of funny that the whole puzzle is all water-based? Speaking of which, Meredith certainly fits the bill, as the Eviolite and Sheer Force combo is doing numbers. Even on Pokemon like Alakazam that you'd imagine would be a big threat. Now one thing I found out is that in Loveridge Town, there's a guy who asks you if you understand what he's saying, and if you say yes as I did initially, he doesn't do anything. But if you tell him that he's incomprehensible, he gives you a Swords Dance TM. What is actually happening here? Checking out Eleanor in the PC, she's not only plus speed and minus special attack, but also has Hustle to increase attack power at the cost of accuracy. It's more so worth evolving her though, as she becomes a girder, and now has color change to change her type to the type of the move that hits her. With the Eviolite boost in consideration too, I'm gonna replace Beedrill for now. With that, it's time for the fourth gym leader, Flannery, who's looking kinda crazy, I'm not gonna lie. She begins with a Pokemon that is more or less our worst nightmare, Slowbro, as I had led with Eleanor. I promptly switch in Molly, who's able to get the job done with Magical Leaf, then in comes Rotom Wash Form, who hits a Confuse Ray. Regardless, we land a Magical Leaf for a third, and initially Molly ate up a Shockwave well, but it turns out this thing has Parental Bond, so it hits twice every move. Our Berry did help, but then we hit ourselves in Confusion. Oof. Eventually, we did get another hit off to bring her to the red, but we're getting too low on health, so I switch into Eleanor here to tank two uproars, or technically four, to just 22 HP before landing a power-up punch to take it down. I wasn't expecting to get so hurt, so when her final Pokemon Cleffa comes in, I still switch to play it safe and nail her with a stab, super effective, sheer force boosted acid spray to win the battle and her fourth badge. After Danny flexes his might, taking down a Rashiram of all things, and as much as I'm loving Sheer Force and Eviolite, I think our next evolution is still worth it, as Meredith evolves into a Tentacruel with Overcoat. Not bad. Beth also evolves into a Luxray, and ironically enough also gets Overcoat. Huh. Keeping Rockhead would have been good for Wild Charge, but oh well. It's already time for the fifth gym leader, our very own Daddy Norman, who's busy meditating. <laughs> And I gotta be honest, our dad needs to train more. He led with a Skiddo, and I could switch in Eleanor and repeatedly power a punch to raise our attack, taking it down with ease. Then, by the time his Beldum came in, our attack was at sky high levels, so super effective Dig pulverized it. His final Pokemon was a Slurpluff, my favorite. And to play it safe, I got our newly evolved Meredith out there to tank an attack and respond with a super effective Acid Spray for the win. If only we had more breaks like this one. Also, Dad, you know you don't need all these flat screen TVs to make it appear like you're in nature to make up for your lack of natural talent, right? Oh, wait, wouldn't our natural talent be genetically linked? Haha, <laughs> there we go, the rebirth of a true legend. The air is tasty here. <laughs> 
Ooh, the Flame Orb. Never gets old getting random items. On Route 115, we can pick up a Spearow that I named Nadia, and then it's time for another cool item, a Megastone, the Glalotite. Not only that, but I also found a Noibat I named Ricky with the Delta Stream ability, which eliminates all of the flying type's weaknesses. Pretty wild, but it's a shame that it won't have it upon evolving. Now for once, I didn't forget to head back to Doofer to pick up the Sludge Bomb TM, perfect for Meredith, as it's only available here after you get the fifth badge. And another oft-forgotten thing is the abandoned ship, which is now known as the Sea Mauville, and which is massive. Not much to do here yet, although I could grab the Wise Glasses to boost special moves. Surfing nearby nets us a new encounter opportunity as we find a Charmander swimming in the water. Seems legit. I name him Billy, and we can also find a Blitzel nearby that I named Debra, and a Solosis I named Maddie. Uh, hey yo, can I catch this thing? I technically haven't gotten an encounter on this route yet. I've gotta say, the soaring feature is definitely one of the coolest and least expected features we've ever had introduced in the franchise. Hey, look at us. Look at us. Huh? Who would've thought? Not me. Up ahead, I had one of those moments that only happen in randomizers. As the damn Vibrava I was facing turned Eleanor into a ground type due to color change, which then meant that Clawitzer smashed us to just 4 HP with super effective Bubble Beam. Holy, that was close. Shortly after, we get a key item that I've been long awaiting, the Mega Bracelet. Meaning we're now capable of Mega Evolution if we can find both a Pokemon and the Mega Stone to match. On Route 118, we can pick up a Linoon that I named Edward, and also on Route 119, a which I name Andrew. We could almost make an early root rodent team at this rate. Up ahead, we arrive at the Weather Institute, where tropical dreams of sunshine can come true through the power of science. Fire! Turns out the cast form gift you get for saving the place is actually a giraffe rig, which I named Wilma and who has friend guard. Meh. Did have the mystic water item though, which is handy. After that whole ordeal, we run into Mei who challenges us to battle again, and this time she has a Pangoro lead. Quite a darn big threat for Tommy, I must say. I make the switch into Eleanor who tanks an attack well, and then with our jolly nature, we actually outspeed with wake up slap for the one hit KO. Then in comes a Hydreigon. Would have been terrifying for anyone but Eleanor as we slam her into the red, but then she uses Roar as Meredith gets brought out. With a base 100 speed, we can Sludge Bomb for the KO, and this is actually a great setup leading into her Magmar, as with Surf, we can now one-hit KO that thing as well for the relatively clear sweep. That win grants us access to one of my favorite cities in the franchise, Fortree, which is just a delight to see fully remade in 3D. Route 120 to the east nests us a new encounter, ironically enough, a Pangoro, which we just fought, which I name Eva and who ends up having color change. Hitting up the Scorched Slab, a hidden cave I realize technically counts as a new encounter area, I find... This has got to be a sick joke. Technically, that does activate Species Claws, so I rerolled to get a Crustle, who I named Bam, and who had the Anger Point ability, which increases attack if it gets crit. With some preparation under our belt, it's time for the Fortree City Gym, and interestingly, you can actually skip all of the trainers in here and make it straight to the sixth gym leader, Winona. Just because it feels natural to lead with an electric type against her, I led with a recently evolved Beth as she sent out a Kranidos. Not an ideal matchup, so I switch into Tommy with the Eviolite, and a single Bulldoze has enough power to KO. But then, in comes a Hitmonlee of all things, and I thought we had a perfect answer in Molly, but she used Focus Energy on the Switch. Uh oh. Although, she then misses a high jump kick and gets a recoil to half, then I went to paralyze it with Thunder Wave, but it had motor drive so it just powered up its speed. Oh no. Absolutely worst case scenario. Now what? I decide to go for Charm at least to lower its attack, and then switch into Meredith, but she lands a crit high jump kick on the switch which does way over half. I can't safely stay in now, so I go back into Molly. She then lands another, and another crit. Grit. But our berry brings us above half again, so I stay in and hit it with a magical leaf. Another attack thankfully doesn't get a crit, and then we hit her into the red, but then she uses a hyper potion. Oh, why? Eventually, I make the switch into Eleanor, though, and with Hitmonlee's lowered attack and fortunately no crit this time, we could take it down in a couple attacks. Then, in comes Braviary, the perfect counter to us, but we do have a perfect counter of our own as Beth eats up an Aerial Ace and demolishes it with a spark. In comes an Embor of all things next, and I use Baby Doll Eyes to lower its attack, and then proceed to slug it out, take down versus spark, with Beth emerging the victor in the end and winning us our sixth badge. On Route 121, we have a new encounter opportunity, and, uh, mommy? 
Rerolling, we then find a Zangoose that I named Wilfred who has Frisk and the Pokedex describes as a cat ferret. Okay, I mean, I guess. Arriving in Lily Cove, the final May battle took me by surprise as unlike in the original, she battles you on the stairway leading to the north of town instead of right in front of the department store. Even though I went in unhealed as a consequence, this battle was quite easy with our current coverage and even her now fully evolved Mag Mortar wasn't a huge threat. Although it did tank a surf surprisingly, but Meredith having overcoat in the sand was pretty cool. Not being able to wait any longer, I finally had Eleanor evolve into a beastly Turbo Blaze Conkelder. One of my favorite fights types to use, and Tommy also evolves into a Gigalith with Primordial C. Not quite as good as Battle Armor I'd say, but the increase in attack power should be well worth it. Now wanting to see what ability he would get, I trained up Billy all the way into a Charizard who has Healer. Not great, but we do have a huge ground weakness I've noticed, so I decide to replace B-Barrel with him for now. Oh hey look, it's the Great Saiya Man! That Dragon Ball Z arc still gives me secondhand cringe every time I think about it. No spoilers, but thank the skies above for the new movie. That's all I'm gonna say. In Lily Cove, we get a Smeargle encounter, and uh, that's all I'm gonna say about that, too. And in the Safari Zone, I'm very thankful it operates as just a regular wild grass area, as that means we won't lose our encounter, which ends up being a Bulbasaur I name Henry. A couple more encounters come in the form of a Kranidos named Tyson and a Surskit named Malcolm, and then we had a very close call with a damn Mega Garchomp of all things, which nearly shredded my life apart, but our own beast Eleanor tanked it out on 15 HP in the red. Our Mount Pyre encounter ended up being a Bonsly, after which we could hit up the Magma Hydra, which ended up getting quite the upgrade apparently, definitely one of the most improved areas in the game I'd say. I was a bit surprised by this, but Primordial C actually came in handy with Tommy, as we could switch switch into a Magmortar's fire move, which doesn't even work when it's in effect. Pretty cool. After picking up a Sawsbuck and grabbing the Assault Vest, one of my favorite competitive items ever, we then encountered a giant horde of trainers whose Pokemon I forgot would be all random, and I was terrified when I saw them, but thankfully they were all level 18. Poor Billy, must have scared him to death too. Okay, not gonna lie, shout out to Game Freak for this one, a Camrupt submarine is hilarious. On Route 124, we can then find an Elekid I named Igor, and on another water route nearby, I completed the Kanto starter trio with a Squirtle named Bentham. Moss Deep City is our next destination, where we can grab a Frogadier named Xavier, and believe me, I was excited about a potential Greninja too, but uh, it had a brave plus attack and minus speed nature. Literally the worst possible. Now having done a crap ton of evolving our roster, I was noticing that we weren't really getting anything too great. Telepathy Mamoswine, Magic Guard Sudowoodo, Rough Skin Electivire, which isn't bad, No Guard Sawsbuck, but then I saw that our Venusaur has Drought. Oh man, not only would that mean it could set up one turn Solar Beam for itself, but it also increases the recovery from Synthesis too. With the level cap now higher, I could also finally evolve William, our Snow Runt, into a Glalie, and it ends up having Guts. Having picked up a Flame Orb and the Protect TM earlier, this could be fantastic, so I'm gonna replace Clefable for now. Before anything though, we did pick up the Glalitite earlier too, so I want to test out Mega Glalie in the Moss Deep Gym. It is quite a monster visually, and does do a huge amount of damage despite a lack of EVs. With that said though, don't forget that Megas usually have different abilities than their base forms, and while Mega Evolved, William has... Blaze. Oh boy, couldn't get much worse than that. I think using Glalie with Guts is a much better idea, as he's able to obliterate things with Guts boosted 140 power facade. Exodia! And to top it all off, we ran into what every randomizer player fears the most, a damn Regigigas. That's right, with random abilities, that means it won't have slow start, and a Pokemon with these base stats gets unleashed from the get-go, and inevitably demolishes our lead. Rip, William. With that depression behind us, it's time for the 7th Gym Leaders, Tate and Liza, and I think I have the perfect double strategy. A Drought Venusaur combined with a Charizard. Powering up Billy's fire moves, we can do over half on Meowstic immediately while switching Venusaur out to avoid psychic damage. A second hit then takes Meowstic down, and Beth's super effective spark smashes Fletchender after Billy gets brought to half by acrobatics. Huh. Well, 
that wasn't nearly as bad as it could have been. Leaving the gym, we witness a massive explosion of gigantic proportions erupting from the ocean. That's right, it's the end of the world, and Steven takes us into his home to tell us that he's too busy to deal with this right now? What could possibly be more important than preventing the literal apocalypse? I need to study my rocks. Trying to find a way to save the planet on my own, I ran into a place that's literally called Secret Island. Yup, that's a canon location in the Pokemon world. The water routes nearby net us a few new encounters including a Staryu, Bellossom, and Lombre before we then make it to the bottom of the seafloor cavern where Team Magma Leader Maxi challenges us to battle. He leaves with a Lickitung as I get Meredith out there. Sludge Bomb does a huge amount and poisons it before he does hardly any damage on us with Slam. A Surf from there is able to take it down and put it out of its misery of standing on lava. In comes Patrat next who has a one-hit KO with the same move and then in comes Fungus. I had taught Meredith Ice Beam for coverage though which comes in very handy against it, and his final Pokemon ends up being a Beedrill, which promptly Mega Evolves. Not wanting to take any chances, I switch into Tommy, who eats up two attacks from him, although we did get poisoned, then Rock Slide smashes him to the ground and wins us the battle. Mega Beedrill's older brother, the legendary Groudon, then awakens, and I've gotta say, they did the legendary sequence quite well here. I felt much more fear from this than Ruby, that's for sure. And you can actually see the process Groudon uses of starting to create land throughout the region. Wait a minute, did, did he just create a new sun? Ah, Sutopolis City is absolutely gorgeous in this game. Oh, would you please just leave one moment unruined? In the Cave of Origin, we encounter a Vanillish to capture, after which, well, I've gotta say, riding Groudon was not what I anticipated going into this remake. In a wild course of events, Groudon becomes Primal Groudon, quite a damn beastly looking monster, and it was only now that I realized Groudon itself would be randomized? Oh boy. After chucking my Master Ball at not Groudon, and returning to the PC, I realized the Rashiram was modest with the multi-scale ability. Goodness f that's the scariest thing I've ever seen. It's time for the eighth and final gym leader, Wallace, normally a water specialist. He leaves with a Larvitar as I get Billy out on the field. Not a great matchup, so I went into Henry for the four times damage Giga Drain KO, which I knew would restore any damage that we got from the switch. Elgium then comes out, so I switch into Beth to take it down with a super effective crunch after it just used Calm Mind. In comes a Girder next, and I use Baby Doll Eyes to lower its attack, making it safe to get Billy out there again and go for a stab, super effective fly. But but it barely doesn't KO on a sliver and lands a four times damage rock slide. But thankfully after that attack drop we survive on a bit less than half and can KO it with two flame bursts after he healed. Whew. In comes Fennekin next, which is an easy switch back into Meredith, although it did use Sunny Day, so a Sludge Bomb does the job instead. In comes his final Pokemon, a Brazen. Not wanting to get hit by a Psychic move, I switch into Gigalith, who's able to strike it with Rock Slide to win us our eighth and final badge. Solid. The final route on the way to the league lands us a Magnezone, a great encounter on the face of it, but it just had the Illuminate ability, so quite wasted potential. With that, we've arrived at the final test, Victory Road, where we we can get our last encounter of the game, an Onyx. Facing things like speed boost Togekiss along the way and finding funny little things like this. It's all connected. It's been right in front of us. Everything is pointing in the same direction. A long trip has us reached the end of the road where none other than Wally awaits for a final battle. Wally leads with a camera up and I had sent Billy out there. Not an ideal matchup, so I switched into Meredith knowing he wouldn't have used a ground move on Charizard. Then, after we get yawned, we can wipe it off the map with a Surf. Unfortunately, this does mean we fall asleep, and as stubborn as I am, I stayed in against his clink for like four turns when we remained asleep, and eventually woke up around half health to take him down with a neutral Surf. Fortunately, his next Pokemon was a Rapidash, which we still outspeed and decimate, and in comes Lipard next. We have a perfect counter for this thing in Conkelder, who tanks Night Slash with ease and responds with a stab super effective power-up punch. Hoping that would be a benefit for his final Pokemon, it looks like it will be as he sends out a Gyarados. Yes, it looks like a huge threat on the face of it, but I know that Wally's final Pokemon is usually a Mega. So that's right, he Mega evolves into Mega Gyarados, which is part dark typing. And a stab super effective 100 power plus one hammer arm crit annihilates him. Poor Wally. Kid can never catch a break, huh? Well, we've arrived. The final test, the Hoenn Pokemon League. And ooh, sparkles. Okay, sorry. After fulfilling the rest of our EVs and searching far and wide across the region for any other items we might be able to make use of, it's time for the Elite Four. 
The first Elite Four member is Sydney, and boy oh boy does it ever feel weird not being able to come up with plans to face the strongest trainers in the region, but let's go for it. And his lead ends up being a Murkrow against Henry. Not ideal, so I go into Tommy, who I realize is going to be a perfect switch against all Henry's counters except for Psychic, especially with Primordial C. Murkrow used Tailwind on the switch, but Tommy eats up his foul play pretty well before Rockslide does him in. Then in comes an Excadrill. Ooh. Now that's a tough one. Even Billy would be dangerous to switch in for fear of a rock move, so I go into Eleanor, who gets crit by a stab 100 power earthquake from a 135 base attack Pokemon. Ouch. I know we can survive a non-crit here though, so I end up staying in as he uses Swords Dance and Brick Break cuts him in half. Then, in comes the legendary Rashiram. Wow. Quite a roster Sydney has these days. Our only real answer here is Tommy, as Extrasensory does not too much. It's very risky to stay in here, but we have no other switch in for him, so I stay in. And he has Dragon Breath, apparently. But Tommy tanks it on just 4 HP before the Rock Slide response takes him down. Damn, that was close. As if that wasn't enough, in comes a Mega Charizard X out of nowhere. This randomizer is kicking my ass right now. I have no choice but to try to get Meredith out as we tank Flamethrower well, then have to opt for Neutral Surf, which gets a crit, but leaves him on just a sliver. In the end, after he heals, we can at least get two hits off in a row to KO him. His final Pokemon ends up being a Heatmore, which is finally a bit of a break as Surf ends the battle. First one down, and quite scary, I'd say. The second Elite Four member is Phoebe, normally a Ghost-type trainer, and I've never understood the whole tropical, upbeat dancing theme for a scary Ghost trainer, but, uh... We'll roll with it. She leads with a Quillfish, and boy oh boy do we ever have the perfect counter in a Drought Venusaur. One turn solar beaming it to evaporate it immediately. Oh, I love Drought Venusaur. In comes Slowpoke next, which suffers the same fate, and the same goes for her Trap Inch too, and oh man, her whole team is weak to grass as Marowak then gets destroyed. This is epic. Her final Pokemon ends up being a Ninjask, and I think I have the perfect answer for this. In comes Charizard in the sun, and... That's right, I had scoured the region for the Charizardite Y. And not only that, found out that Billy has the Compound Eyes ability when Mega evolved, making Fire Blast a very viable option with 100% accuracy. Same with Air Slash, and even bumping up Focus Blast too, and we absolutely incinerate her final Pokemon. Oh, this is good. The third Elite Four member is Glacia, normally an Ice-type trainer, and funnily enough, she does stay consistent with a Bergmite lead, which I kept Beth in against to repeatedly hit it with Spark to KO, being left at half health. Stunky was next, and Tommy with Earthquake would have been a perfect counter, but the damn thing self-destructed anyway. Dragalge then came in, and type-wise is a little complicated for us, especially if it has a water move, but we do have one perfect counter, Meredith with Ice Beam who gets the job done. Then in came a Mega Manetric, not so great for Meredith, so I got Eleanor out there with the Assault Vest to tank up special attacks, and Earthquake of course did it in. Her final Pokemon is a Quilladin, and Mega Charizard was a beautiful counter with Fire Blast, sending it into the Shadow Realm. The last Elite Four member is upon us, Drake, normally a Dragon Master, but he definitely switched it up this time. Seal was an immediate KO with Spark from Beth, his tanky Meganium was no match for Mega Charizard's Fire Blast, Sea King was then picked off easily with the help of Drought and Solar Beam from Henry, and then the same went for his Cloyster and Patrat too. I've gotta say, the type coverage on our team is quite unreal. Well, it's time. The final battle, the champion of the Hoenn region, at least until Wallace takes his place, but shh, don't say anything, Steven Stone. After he talks about awakening something inside us, no idea what he could mean there. It's time to do battle. His lead is a Dedenne, whose fairy typing isn't ideal for Eleanor, but with the Assault Vest, I'm feeling okay, although he went for the physical play rough for a third or so before Earthquake devastated him. In comes a tricky Pokemon for us, a Hypno, but I send in Beth as he goes for Nasty Plot. Fortunately, we outspeed though, so a super effective crunch is enough to eliminate that threat. Next is Steelix, again a tricky one as it could have coverage against almost our entire team, but knowing he'll likely go for a ground move and almost undoubtedly doesn't have strength, I get Charizard out there, and he indeed goes for Dig. After he pops up, I can then nail him with a stab super effective 110 power fire blast from a base 159 special attack Pokemon. 
poor thing never had a chance. Scrafty then came in, and 100% accuracy stab air slash is the perfect answer, making it through its bulk in one hit. And Mian Xiao definitely didn't fare any better as Mega Charizard even outdoes its crazy speed with air slash. Then his final Pokemon is Sharpedo, pretty much the perfect Charizard counter, and I know it's gonna Mega Evolve too, so I get Henry out there and set up the drought and weaken its moves, then pulverize it with a one turn solar beam for the final victory. What a savage. Well, we did it. We beat a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Omega Ruby with the game randomized like crazy, and that was a really fun adventure. The early game and random legendaries throughout were quite tough, and I could imagine without us having access to like infinite Eviolites, we might have struggled a lot more. I actually really like our final team. Might have to try it out on Showdown or something, as it consists of a lot of my favorites. As always, make sure to subscribe to join the Self Army and help us get to a quarter million, and I'll see you guys next time for another challenge video.